that uh, students were dropping out of school. And we should not underestimate the significance of this problem. Obviously, dropouts aren't going anywhere. They're on a trajectory towards uh, misery. They're not getting jobs. And incredibly, I serve as uh, not only on the Education and Labor Committee, but also I serve on the uh, chair of the Crime Subcommittee. And there are those that drop out of school on a direct uh, uh, trajectory towards prison. In fact, there's one study that showed that for 26 to 30 year old high school, African American high school dropouts, 36 to 30 year old African American high school dropouts, more of them today are in jail than working. Now, obviously, dropping out of school sends you on, a, uh, on, on the wrong trajectory. So we're starting to uh, work our way up in the in the in these two panels today. We're starting with the basics. Uh, first panel will cover improving uh, early childhood education, and we'll hear about the importance and impact of early childhood education and the administration's priorities. Uh, during the second panel, we will examine initiatives that will improve high school graduation uh, priorities and promoting systemic interventions to improve graduation rates improve principal and teacher effectiveness, uh, inno innovation in uh, career education uh, uh, efforts, particularly in the STEM, the science, technology, uh, engineering, and math, and STEM uh, programs, and I think we can do to improve uh, those for African Americans. Last week we passed the Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act, and we'll be able to make significant inroads not only in helping students get into and complete uh, college education, we also included an early education, early learning challenge grant uh, program to uh, help uh, low-income students get uh, do better by the time they get to kindergarten by focusing on the birth through five age range. I hope the discussion that we have today will facilitate ideas so that we can work to improve the education system for the betterment of all students nationally. I'm joined by my distinguished colleague from uh, New Jersey, um, expert on Africa, but also a uh, member of the Education and, uh, and Labor Committee, uh, Don Payne, who has a few remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. Uh, it's always good to be on our Education Brain Trust. Uh, we, uh, as you know, have so many issues that we can cover, and it's uh, only uh, one or two that we get to each year. Of course, we deal with them all year long, but let me welcome all of you here. Certainly appreciate our panelists uh, for being here, and as you know, uh, this brain trust is uh, entitled Ensuring the Academic Success of Black Youth, Early Childhood and High School Graduation Initiatives. Some of those uh, issues, as we all know, and the experts here certainly will be able to give us uh, knowledge and insight that will contribute to the discussion. I know many of you are educational uh, experts, and so we look forward to the wealth of information that should be shared here this afternoon. Uh, I think we've already mentioned it, but in the, the percentages vary according to who's giving you the information. My information now says that about 30% of high school uh, students drop out before graduation. I've heard the numbers as high as 50%. And you know what's interesting? That school districts really have different ways of saying who drops out. And it's uh, sometimes smoke and mirrors and games that are played. Uh, by districts so that it makes their um, their their uh, uh, numbers look better. But I'll use 30 percent because that's terrible. And if it's higher, it's even worse. Uh, we know that um, more than half a million young people fail to graduate from high school each year. Although spending on education has increased significantly, and I have to admit, and especially as Congressman Scott mentioned, this bill that was passed through the House last week was the greatest increase. It's, it's greater than the GI Bill of Rights after World War II. You've got to realize it is more significant than the GI Bill after World War II. Uh, as you know, it indexes Pell Grants. It moves it up to about 5,900, goes up to close to 7,000. It's unbelievable what and is an entitlement. Uh, but we'll get into that later. But it's, uh, but in spite of the spending that's been increased, and we hope that the new spending will help to sort of turn this around, we still have a tremendous number of young people um, dropping out. And the sad part is that 
the student dropout rate over the past 30 years has been about the same, in spite of the increased attention and the increased spending. Traditionally, we have exerted uh, efforts to address this problem by focusing solely on secondary education, extending our efforts towards improving high school curriculum, counseling programs, extracurricular activities, and other programs. All of those components are important. However, we are just now acknowledging, some of us knew it before, but that there are many issues that lead students to drop out, and we know that it begins as early as kindergarten. By age six, low-income children know about 3,000 words, while a child from a high-income family has a, a vocabulary of 20,000 words. So a kid, like I said, from the poor areas, starts out with only about one-sixth. And that's in, that's in kindergarten. So we really have to start much earlier, certainly far from high school and junior high and even elementary. As a result of this and similar findings, there is now a nationwide effort to educate and start to concentrate on zero to the five-year-old population. I have worked to address literacy gaps through the Prescribed Book Act. This bill that I've introduced provides funding for the implementation of three-part model through which one, health care providers encourage parents to read aloud to their children and offer them recommendations and strategies for doing so. Two, health care providers give each visiting child between the ages of six months and five years a new developmentally appropriate children's book to take home and keep in three volunteers of reading to children in health care facilities, waiting areas, show parents the techniques and pleasures of reading aloud to their children. So if they go there, they have to sit there, they have to wait there. So if we had this program, we had the book, someone could read it, they could give them the book, maybe we can make a small, small another inroad into the problem. So this initiative will jumpstart the child's uh, literacy, we hope, and, and, uh, and so we have challenges, we all have uh, different approaches to it, but we really look forward to this outstanding panel, and it's great to be here with uh, Bobby Scott again. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by the co-chair of the uh, of this, uh, this session, a uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, a member of the Powerful Appropriations Committee, who before he got there, he was on the Education and Labor Committee, where it was his bill that created the Gear Up program. Please welcome the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Shaka Patel. start. I'm going to be as brief as I can, but I'll make a couple of quick points. One is, uh, Gear Up could not have happened without the support of uh, my two colleagues. They were the, the original co-sponsors of that bill, Congressman Scott and Congressman Payne. And uh, some 10 years later, some 6 million young people later, some $3 billion later, um, it is the, the most successful uh, early college awareness program in the country's history, the largest. It's in 48 states and in all of our territories. It's doing a wonderful job. 85% high school graduation rate, 65% of these kids going on to college. And so give my colleagues a round of applause. That year we were had two bills on the floor. We had the 21st Century uh, Juvenile Predators Act, which was the Republicans' view of what we needed to be doing, building more juvenile prisons and preparing uh, for a whole new generation of uh, juveniles who were going to be involved in antisocial behavior. And uh, uh, we were debating uh, gear up and what we termed them to be 21st century scholars. And uh, that's really the choice point here. It's about where our young people are going to end up. And what we now know, and I, I, I chaired the uh, Children's Summit uh, that the speaker set up and how, we now know that, you know, gear up is wonderful. It starts in middle school and that's great. So, but we know that there's work to be done a lot earlier in this process. And we now know a lot about that. And it's zero to six, and um, it's where the action is. 57% of these children's brains are developed before the third trimester. Uh, we know that prenatal care is critical. We know that these neurons uh, these, uh, that are taking place in these young children's brains 700 times a second uh, from, uh, in, the, in the zero to four range that they can learn 
all manner of things, but it's like arch it's, it, if the architecture is not developed, it stymies their development long term down the road. And, and the last thing I'll, I'll say as you get ready to get started is we're already doing the work, and um, it's an amazing thing because Bobby, Scott, and, and Donald Payne, uh, Bill came out of their committee just last week. It was on college affordability, and we moved it through the floor. But down in this bill was something called the Early Ch Learning Challenge Grants. And nothing to do with higher education. It actually, it's billions of dollars that are focused on zero to six and make a real difference as part of the Obama uh, administration's uh, uh, program to have us really invest in all child education. And so this is a timely and, uh, and uh, urgent uh, meeting of the uh, Brain Trust. I want to thank my colleagues for convening it. I unfortunately am, have some other larger responsibilities, so I, I'll have to leave at some point. But uh, I did want to come because there's no more important issue for us uh, than the education of future generations. Thank you. We have, um, we have several speakers. Can you figure out how to get this thing out of the? Um, I'm gonna press. The, never mind. Never mind. I just touched the right button. <laughs> Darn it. Our panelists will begin with Roberto Rodriguez, who serves as the White House uh, Domestic Policy Council and Special Assistance to President Obama for Education. He previously served as Chief Education Counsel for the, uh, in the office of Senator Ed Kennedy, uh, Chairman of the HUB Committee. He also helped shape legislation addressing early childhood education, elementary and secondary education, higher education, and adult education. Prior to working on Capitol Hill, he worked as a Senior Educational Specialist the National Council of Raza. Next will be Jacqueline Jones, who serves as the U.S. Department of Ed who serves in the U.S. Department of Education as a senior advisor to the Secretary for er Early Learning. Prior to joining the department, she served in the New Jersey State Department of Education as Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Early Childhood Education. Prior to that, Dr. Jones worked for 16 years at the Education Testing Service (ETS). And she has been a visiting associate professor professor at Harvard University and a visiting professor for ETX. Uh, Sonia, Dr. Sonia Anderson is the National Director for the First Five Years Fund, which is committed to improving the lives of adverse children by leveraging cost-effective investments in early learning. She began her career as part of the Mississippi Teaching Corps, teaching high school French and history. She served as a program associate for the Ford Foundation in New York City and a senior associate at Creative, Asso Creative Associates International in Washington, D.C., then as Education Program D Director at the Oprah Winfrey Foundation. Uh, Gordon McKinnis is a fellow at the Century Foundation Equality and Education Project. Prior to serving as a fellow, he served as Assistant Commissioner for Abbott in Implementation for the New Jersey Department of Education and as President of Citizens for Better Schools, a New Jersey-based nonprofit organization. He is a former member of the New Jersey State Senate and the New Jersey State Assembly. Holly Mitchell is Chief Executive Officer of Crystal Stairs, one of the largest private, nonprofit child development agencies in California, facilitating care for approximately 25,000 children on a daily basis. Her team has championed the public affairs agenda and has, that has helped increase the visibility of child care as a critical public policy issue. Before joining Crystal Stairs, she was a legislative advocate for Western Center, Western Center on Law and Poverty and was the executive director of the California Black Women's Health Project. David Johns currently serves as Senior Education Policy Advisor to the Senate Committee on uh, Education, excuse me, Health, Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, the Health Committee. He is the principal staffer responsible for the committee's work on early childhood education issues affecting children and families, workforce investment programs and activities. Prior to working for the Senate Health Committee, he served as a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow in the office of Congressman Charlie Rangel. Uh, John graduated with honors from Columbia in 2004 with a triple major in English, creative writing, and African American studies. His research as a Mellon, Mellon Fellow served, uh, his research as a Mellon Fellow served as a catalyst to identify, disrupt, and supplant uh, problems with uh, black males both in academia and society. 
Following graduation, he obtained a master's degree in sociology and education policy at Teachers College at Columbia University while simultaneously teaching elementary school in New York. In 2007, he was named as one of Ebony Magazine's 30 top leaders under 30. Uh, we'll now begin with uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking Congressman Scott uh, for that introduction and acknowledging uh, both Congressman Scott and Congressman Fouta for their leadership uh, at the CBC on education issues. Um, their uh, long-standing voice uh, in terms of supporting uh, improved achievement for our African American community has been tremendously important and helpful. Uh, Congressman Scott in particular on, on his work on the graduation rate and really bringing the importance of improving the graduation rate for all of our youth front and center to many of the discussions that we've had here in Washington on No Child Left Behind uh, has been tremendously important. Uh, Congressman Fatah uh, for his leadership on the GEAR UP program and on his leadership around, uh, around really addressing our dropout crisis, uh, which is uh, tremendously important. Uh, issue that uh, the president is committed to uh, making progress on uh, in, in this administration. And also want to thank and acknowledge Congressman Payne for his leadership, longstanding leadership on the Ed and Labor Committee in the, in the House, uh, and for his work on early childhood education through the Prescriber Brook program, which is a uh, tremendously uh, important program uh, to promote literacy among our youngest, uh, our youngest children. Uh, I'd like to begin by really, um, I, I know I'm going to, I've been asked to speak a little bit about early childhood education, so I'd like to walk through some of the uh, President's priorities around the Early Learning Challenge Fund, but begin by really expressing the important role that education plays and education policy plays in our domestic agenda moving forward in the administration. Uh, back in February, uh, as the President addressed the joint session of Congress, he really laid out uh, an, an agenda or, and, and laid out some of his domestic priorities uh, around health care, around energy, and around education, and talked about the challenges that are facing our nation on all three of these fronts. Um, we've been uh, embroiled lately, uh, nationally, in a conversation around health care and health care reform and certainly look forward to swift action in Congress to improve and reform our health insurance program. But as we've had those conversations, our administration has been making steady progress on the President's agenda to improve uh, educational opportunities for all of our youth, and really to deliver, as he put back in March, a complete and competitive education for all of our children from cradle all the way through career. Uh, I want to acknowledge that progress because I think it's very important. We've had quite a bit of work done uh, and our Secretary of Education has really been leading the charge on our race to the top. Uh, this is a challenge that the President put forth across our country in March to reform, transform, strengthen America's elementary and secondary schools to really better deliver opportunity and, and success for all of our students. That's really focused on uh, delivering higher standards, uh, more rigorous and relevant standards uh, for our K-12 education system, uh, improving uh, teacher effectiveness, and supporting leadership in our schools. Uh, and that's really about investing in uh, new ways to uh, recognize and reward success uh, amongst our teachers across our country, as well as new supports for our teachers, and uh, really help, uh, new avenues to deliver the knowledge and skills that our teachers are going to need to be able to succeed and teach these 21st century standards and skills. Also, a new focus on turning around our lowest performing schools, and this is particularly important as we talk about the imperative of graduation. We have over 2,000 of our schools, just over 2,000 of our schools, um, to which we can link over half of America's dropouts. And uh, being able to really bring to bear a new strategy around transforming education in those schools, uh, in particular for our neediest students, uh, is really an, an imperative that we have to move forward on 
not only a moral imperative for our country, but an economic imperative. Um, delivering this complete and competitive education for our nation's elementary, middle, and high school students is about securing our economic future success. Um, so we're very excited about the work that's underway in the race to the top. Uh, we have states that have already embraced this challenge and are beginning to uh, move forward and uh, develop applications uh, and develop plans to apply to the Department of Education for this $4 billion uh, incentive fund. Uh, we'll look forward to making uh, grants under the Race to the Top early next year and then have a second round of grant funds in spring of 2010. I'd also like to briefly acknowledge the great work that is underway in Congress with the Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act in the House, as well as the great work that's underway in the Senate currently around negotiating a package uh, to accompany that legislation. That legislation is uh, tremendously important in that it enacts uh, the President's vision around really transforming our higher education system to deliver more efficient and reliable student aid to our students, to shore up the Pell Grant, and, as well as to uh, embark upon a new challenge of really helping advance college completion, in particular for, uh, for our neediest students. We have a higher education policy framework right now at the federal level that's uh, really orchestrated around college access and around affordability, both through the, through the Pell Grant as well as through other uh, federal student loan programs. Uh, as well as through the uh, American Opportunities uh, Tax Credit, which is a credit that was enacted and, and uh, enhanced as part of the recovery package. But in order to really succeed, we, we need to be sure that we're not just helping get our students to the college doors, but also helping them walk through those doors and helping them succeed along that pipeline to be able to graduate ready for success. Uh, the President has issued a goal and a challenge to, the, to our entire country that by 2020, we again can lead the world in, uh, in the highest proportion of college graduates. And uh, being able to reach that goal uh, requires a new investment in college completion. So as part of this Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act, Congress would make available dollars to establish a new college access and completion fund, which would really be focused on developing new and innovative models at the institutional level, uh, to help uh, more of our students persist through and succeed in college. Looking at new strategies, um, uh, smaller learning communities in our colleges, better academic advising for our students, more support, performance-based scholarships, other types of innovative approaches at both the uh, four-year and two-year institution level to really help our students persist and succeed. Uh, that package also includes Another one of the President's uh, key priorities, the American Graduation Initiative. That initiative is a $12 billion investment in our community college system. Our community colleges are uh, one of our most undervalued um, and under-resourced assets in higher education. And uh, the, the President's initiative here really seeks to strengthen the, co the college pathways for the adult population as well as for recent graduates from, from high school to better access community colleges and to be able to better persist through and complete those degrees and make sure that those experiences in community college and that, and that degree is also closely tied to industry and to career so that we can do more to really help ensure that our students are able to um, count on the degree that they're getting at a community college in terms of meaningful careers um, on, on the other end. Uh, let me speak very briefly about the Early Learning Challenge Fund, which is uh, an investment uh, also included in the uh, Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act that would provide a billion dollars a year to lay a strong foundation for educational success, in particular in the early years. Um, we're talking in the, first, in the first years of life prior to a child's arrival at school and at kindergarten. We know from all the research that learning clearly begins at birth, and, and that the experiences that our youngest children have uh, to be nurtured, to be challenged, to be engaged in high quality experiences with adults are really critical to their future development and their future success. We also know that uh, the investments in the early years are amongst the strongest investments that we can make in education. 
We know that our early learning investments return as high as 15 to 17 percent each year. It's one of the strongest and best investments we can make with our federal dollar. And yet, we know that each day over 11 million of our nation's youngsters spend some time outside of the care of their parents. They may be spending time in a child care program, they may be spending time in a Head Start program, they may be spending time with a family caregiver, in a preschool classroom, in an IDEA program. Regardless of the setting in which those children spend time, we know that the quality of those settings matters greatly. Quality is the key to attaining the powerful <coughs> outcomes that we know can be yielded with early learning investments that are, that are really geared toward high quality programs. The, the quality of a program is key to lowering special education rates later in school. It's key to uh, instilling a higher high school graduation rate among our students. It's key to reducing crime and delinquency rates later in life. Uh, and unfortunately, we still have, in too many of our states, a patchwork of programs and a long way to go in terms of instilling quality across our system. We know that many of our states lack a system that really ties all of their early learning settings toward quality guidelines and toward early learning standards that explicitly define what our children know and are able to do and the milestones that our children need to be able to reach to really enter kindergarten ready for success. So we also know that without our commitment to establishing a high standard of quality and without a commitment to driving a results-oriented and outcomes-oriented framework in early learning, our most disadvantaged children are the ones that are left behind. You heard the statistics that Congressman Payne cited around the school readiness gap which can be as wide as 60 points between children from the highest socioeconomic status and their less affluent peers. We know that even by the time children reach uh, age three, there are disparities in vocabulary growth and, and disparities in language development that begin to persist that largely track socioeconomic lines. So the proposed framework from the president through the Early Learning Challenge Fund, which was announced earlier this year in June, by uh, Secretary Sebelius and Secretary Duncan um, will challenge states to implement results-oriented, standards-driven framework across all of their programs and really challenge states to develop new approaches to raising the bar across all settings, regardless of where children are spending time prior to kindergarten. The fund would invest a billion dollars a year uh, to support a new federal partnership with states and also a new, a new investment around developing model systems of early learning that really will help ensure that America's youngest children are placed on sure footing to be able to meet kindergarten standards. To qualify under the fund, we would ask states to commit to aligning their early learning standards to on what children know and on what children will need to know and to be able to do, uh, to integrate those standards into a comprehensive quality system and a comprehensive rating system so that we're able to better identify programs that are successful, so that we're able to better, better identify programs that need improvement, and so that we're better able to address all of our programs improving along a continuum of progress to make sure that we're increasing the number of our most disadvantaged children uh, having access to, high, to the highest quality care. That's our metric. It's really looking at how we really improve and increase access of our most disadvantaged children to high quality care. We'd ask states through this early, early Learning Challenge Fund to develop new systems to prepare and educate the early education workforce, to develop new strategies to better engage parents, to understand the quality of their children's program, and to develop new methods for uh, gathering data from these programs and really being able to track the progress of where our children are each year. Uh, again, I want to just commend Congress for their work with the administration in moving this uh, important initiative forward. Um, we really applaud the leadership of the House last week in taking this up on a very strong vote, uh, and we look forward to working closely with the Senate to uh, help uh, implement the Early Learning Challenge Fund moving forward. Thank you very much.
Dr. Jones. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to also express I want to express my gratitude also to the legislature for the very strong work it's done to support early learning. As we've said, we have incredibly sobering statistics as we look at graduation rates and, and prison, imprisonment numbers. This is, this is a problem that we can solve. We absolutely believe that if we invest in young children early, we can turn this around. And I think that we have a moment when the President and the Secretary of Education have committed themselves to this work. Uh, so I'm going to dive right into what we're doing at the department and how we think we can, we can support the work and, and move forward this agenda. The department is, is doing several things. One, it is um, having a new position. That is the position of a senior advisor on early learning. It's me. And that's me. I think that it's not the idea. It is, it is the hard work of, of the legislature, of, of advocates, of everyone out there who's been able to raise awareness about early childhood, to know that this is an important area. And so now we have this as a focus. And the secretary has committed himself to, to having someone on board who can really speak to this issue across the department. We're crafting a new early learning agenda, and it is an agenda that goes from birth to grade three. This is really new for the department. Typically, we talk about a K-12 agenda. This is a very clear emphasis on our, our knowledge about where early learning starts, what its implications are, and the good job that we can do. We know that we can document disparities between, between black and white children age three, oh, but earlier than that. But if you look at the early childhood longitudinal study, the birth cohort, we're looking at differences as early as nine months. I mean, the differences in health and in, in awareness. So we've got to really start early, and our commitment to that is shown in really starting at birth and going all the way to grade three. Uh, the states have done a wonderful job, and my own state of New Jersey has done a great job, I want to say, in, in supporting preschool education. And we know that we've done a good job in getting good outcomes for children as we have high quality preschool programs. But those preschool programs for four and five year old children have to be connected to this span of early childhood, this span that goes from birth to grade three. And so we have to look and see what's going on from birth to age three. A lot of learning is going on. Children are trying to figure out the world. They're learning language. They are as aware as they are ever going to be in their lives, and we've got to capture that. We, in, in fact, we can't wait until they're three or four to start. And so we've got to be able to know that we have high quality programs for those children at the, at, when they're born, and actually prenatal care that is most important. Yes. We also want to make sure that as we do this work, and we have high quality programs from birth to age three, and high quality preschool programs, that we haven't lost our investment, that they go on to kindergarten, first, second, and third grade programs that are also high quality. And the department is committed to looking at that. So we're talking about birth through grade three, and that's new and, and very exciting for us. Internally, we're looking at our programs to see what are we funding, how are we funding this age range, and what are we doing with new priorities that can address our agenda. And so as we think about new programs, such as the innovation program, I3, as we think about promised neighborhoods, we're also thinking about how early learning fits into those. So we're starting at the very beginning as we think through new initiatives to try to craft an early learning agenda that will meet the needs of children and families in the very beginning. It means that we are also working externally with other departments. The Department of Health and Human Services is our great partner in this work because they have for a long time been working in child care, they have the Head Start program, and we're going to come together to look at ways in which we can create a set of standards that we know are useful, we can help states to, to look at assessments that are appropriate, developmentally appropriate, and give us information about how children are learning, and we can create situations in which 
we know the settings that children are in are high quality, and that means professional development for the workforce. If you look at the workforce in early childhood, in many cases it's a varied workforce. It has varied levels of experience and expertise, and I think one of the major tasks that we want to do is to be able to provide opportunities to, to lift that workforce, to be able to have the skills that they need to bring kids to a higher level. So we are working very hard to make sure that teachers have the tools that they need to do the job that they need to do. Um, I, I said to a, a group the other day, I worry about this generation of young children. Uh, their world is going to be very complicated. It's going to be a world that is, is competitive at a global level. Uh, they're going to be asked to solve problems that we cannot even imagine. And so we've got to raise the bar. We've got to step it up. And as we look at our programs for young children now, we've got to be able to, to bump up those gains that children are getting. And I think we all have to recommit ourselves to getting the very best for young children, getting the best for their teachers, the best environments, the best settings. And we know what that looks like. We know what high quality looks like. It is not inexpensive, but it, and it can be done. And I think the benefit of it is extraordinary. When you hear those numbers again about who's in prison and what we're paying in special education, it is worth it. It is worth every dime. And so the department is working with Health and Human Services as we go through the Early Learning Challenge Fund. This will be co-administered. We are looking at ways in which we can take the various systems that are in place, because it's not a coherent system right now. We know that. And, and create a streamlined system for children and families to receive services. You know, I said that children and families should not know that there are multiple funding streams. They shouldn't know that there's a Department of Education and a Department of Human Services and a Department of Agriculture. They shouldn't have to think about any of that. They should simply know that they're going to get the very best possible services and that as a country we're going to provide them with the best start that they can possibly get. So that's our commitment and I'm happy to talk with you about that later, but thank you. Thank, thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for uh, mentioning the correlation between early investments and the decision we make between those investments and future crime. As I indicated, I served as the chairman of the Crime Subcommittee, and there's a study published recently by the Pew Research Forum that concluded that any incarceration rate over 500 per 100,000 was actually counterproductive and injected more social pathology in the community than it was curing. Mm -hmm. The average rate in the United States is 700. Mm -hmm. Black community, 2,200. Mm -hmm. 10 states lock up blacks at the rate of 4,000 per 100,000. And if you look at those 10 states where it's 4,000 per 100,000, if you just back that down to the counterproductive rate of 500, and do the back of envelope arithmetic, those cities, those with that kind of rate, are wasting $3,500 per child per year in counterproductive incarceration. If you target the money to the ones that actually need it, you can spend $10,000 a year per child per year in what they're using in counterproductive uh, incarceration. And you look at what kind of early childhood education programs and other programs that can actually eliminate crime, um, uh, you could go a long way in uh, using that money more effectively. So um, we want to, um, oops, hit the wrong button again. Um, our next speaker will be um, Dr. Sonia Anderson, who um, will speak as soon as I figure out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we, um, Where's our own uh, PowerPoint? Okay. Thank you.